Real people, real stories, real recovery. I'm Dougie, and I'm on the road of recovery. Inspiring hope, one story at a time. All right, um, I'm Dougie. I'm a person in a long-term recovery um, from substance abuse and um, mental health issues. I have um, just over two years um, clean, and today I am, a, I am a father, I am a son, I am a brother, I am gainfully employed, and um, most importantly, I am a child of the Most High God. Dougie, thank you so much for taking the time to come out and visit us today and share your hope uh, with On the Road to Recovery. We're really grateful that you could do that for us today. So I want to start kind of at the beginning. Can you share a little bit about your childhood, so family relationships, parents being together, and stuff like that? Uh, I come from a broken home, um, but I had two sets of parents. So for the most part, I had a, um, a great childhood. Um, so uh, I, I did fairly well in school. Um, I was active in sports. Um, I have a couple siblings that, um, you know, uh, uh, they went with dad. I stayed with mom, but we um, stayed connected. I spent my summers with my dad and um, school months with my mom. Um, so, um, yeah, I don't have any complaints about my childhood. It was, uh, it was really good. So. Did you have any trauma or experiences, whether it was an accident or whether it was like abuse, neglect, anything like that? Um, I did not. Um, yeah, I had great parents. Sounds so. good. Um, so tell me a little bit about your first use. What was it like and what did it do for you? So um, I think my first use would would have probably been alcohol. Um, I was at a young age. Um, my dad was a Harley guy and so his friends were Harley guys and stuff like that. So um, we were at some sort of um, gathering for them. and. Um, I was uh, I was sneaking around. I was young. I don't know, probably nine or ten, and I would be the kid that run up. Oh, hey, you need a beer, and I would switch out the beers and take a look, whatever was left in that. So um, uh, innocently, we'll say, you know, and not realizing, you know, uh, what was going on throughout the evening. I ended up um, uh, violently sick and, and drunk or whatever, but um, that did not deter me. Mm -hmm. And then, what did it do for you? What were some feelings that happened, like when it, like that first use? Um, so in the moment, I I was enjoying it until um, it's crazy that I can remember. But like um, uh, my stepmom at the time, um, I remember she said, "Are you okay?" And I was sitting on her bar stool, and I said, "Yeah," and I fell off the bar stool, and um, because it wasn't a secret that you know I'd been drinking or whatever, and you know it was. It was um, it was funny, you know, to them at the time or whatever, you know, not knowing, you know, what the future held or whatever, but yeah, so. Okay, so as your use progressed, can you share a funny and or tragic story that happened that highlighted your use? So when I did speed, it would make me extremely paranoid, yet I would continue to do it. Uh, I would just, uh, I would run and like, oh my gosh, the SWAT team's coming in or, you know, or did you see that and this and that. So that's kind of funny to me now, looking back. Um, tragic, um, so I lost my brother to uh, an overdose uh, seven years ago. Uh, in his passing, um, my other brother got clean and uh, that was really a, a wake up for him. And then um, it took me a little bit to, to get on board with that. But um, uh, now I absolutely use that as a motivation in what I do, so. So can you talk a little bit about how your disease progressed? So you started with the alcohol and marijuana. What did it kind of like end up as? Um, so it ended in um, heroin and uh, meth, you know, for the most part. But um, again, I started young, relatively young. And uh, my brothers were older than me. And in and, and no way, shape or form do I point fingers at anybody. And um, But I wanted to hang out with, you know, um, the older guys and do this and do that and so um, uh, I think around 12 years old I got a paper route um, I had just a little bit of pocket money but that um, led into getting a, a job inside our local newspaper mm -hmm. so as, um, as I was like 15 or so I actually was I was collecting a decent paycheck or whatever and, um, you know my parents are supporting me so this is my money to do whatever you know so um, I'm 
with the older crowd and I see what they're doing, you know, and they're, you know, started out drinking and weed and stuff like that, but, um, uh, pills came along and, um, uh, cocaine. And so I spent, um, probably from around the age of 15, probably 14, 15, um, I started doing pills and, and, uh, cocaine and acid regularly. Um, so, uh, uh, my brothers were two and three years older than me, so uh, like my oldest brother, he was uh, he was a full time uh, employee somewhere, or whatever. So he was making money, and all the people that you know, he had a group of people that he partied with regularly. So um, uh, I showed up, and you know, if I could sneak around and I had my own money or whatever, like that opened doors for me, you know, to be able to get in there. But um, I can remember. Um, uh, my mom would come to my brother's house and she was like, I don't care what you, what kind of dope you're on, you're getting up and you're going to school. Uh, I'd be like hiding in the bedroom pretending like I'm sleeping, but I'm really, you know, tripping my brains out, you know, or whatever. So, um, uh, it progressed rapidly, you know, um, and all the things that I had going on as far as, um, you know, uh, academically and um, in sports and stuff, like I, I thoroughly enjoyed playing baseball. I was really good at it, but um, apparently I enjoyed getting high more. Mm-hmm. And um, so I, uh, uh, I always carried a relatively high GPA. I was, you know, 3.0 or better, you know, closer to four. You know, um, I was fortunate enough. I was one of those guys that didn't have to really study. It just came. Mm-hmm. Um, I was in a school to work program, so that enabled me to, to get out of school at 10 o'clock in the morning. You know, so now I'm out. I wouldn't have to be to work until noon or whatever, and I'd, you know, uh, go get high on whatever it was, and I'd go to work, and I'd do all, you know, whatever it was I was doing. Um, and, yeah, so, uh, you know, I guess really reflecting back on it, you know, I could see the progression. I went from, you know, Vicodins or Percocets to Oxycontins, and, you know, that's, you know, um, to date myself, you know, I'm, I'm over 40, so... This is the mid '90s, and mm-hmm. you know, um, oxycontins were relatively new as far as you know, and they were very accessible, very cheap. You know, um, I was 17 the first time I did heroin, mm. and I remember um, uh, I saw a guy. The guy came in, and he's like, um, and I don't want to get too far ahead of you, but no. the guy came in, and um, uh, he was ripped up, and. He asked, you know, hey, do you guys want this? And, you know, there was a buddy of mine that, you know, I, I partied regularly with. And, you know, we were into the pills pretty heavy together. And he's like, well, you know, we'll try it. Because he's like, well, it's just synthetic heroin, you know, whatever the selling point is, you know. And so we tried it. And I remembered, like, you know, it just made me itch. You know, I liked the euphoria that it gave me. You know, it was because it was obviously similar, you know. Um, but I didn't pursue it after that. You know, really, it was just, you know, I was busy doing all the other things, so, you know, so, yeah. Um, so, I, yeah, and then it just it just progressively got worse and worse and worse, you know, as I stepped into young adulthood. So what, at what point did you recognize, I have a problem? So, I think I was probably 19 or 20, and... Um, so I transitioned from one job to another. Um, when I quit school, um, uh, I had an apprenticeship for masonry. Um, that didn't pan out with the first guy, but I uh, went directly into another job. Um, at this time, I'd been using um, uh, all the time, you know, whether it be pills or whatever it was. But um, at that particular point in life, my primary uh, uh, drug of choice was uh, pain pills and stuff. And um, I was transitioning into more into uh, uh, heroin. Um, I remember I woke up one day, and I just always had it. Um, you know, uh, you know, I'm a young guy. I, I got a good job. I always have money. I don't realize because I'm again I'm ignorant to it or whatever. I don't realize that this is just what I do every day. I I always have it. Um, you know, and and it's just something that I do. I woke up one day and I didn't feel well. I'm like, man, I like didn't want to get out of bed. And, um, uh, I didn't realize that I was dope sick. I didn't have a pill or or any dope or whatever. And it's like, 
man, um, I, I don't know, met up with the guys getting ready to go to work or whatever, and uh, I did a pill, and it was like, I was like, oh, yeah, so um, this is a this is an issue now. This is yeah. a problem, right? So now, and then that triggers things like, you know, now all of a sudden I am dependent on it, and, and my brain knows it, and so now it becomes a high priority, whereas before it was just routine, mm -hmm. if I can say it like that. You know, mm -hmm. so. What happened that helped you to decide to get help? So I had a near fatal overdose. Um, so um, I actually left a treatment facility that I was um, uh, I was doing pretty well in. Um, prior to that overdose, I was putting together some substantial clean time, and um, and the process of I was refusing to let go of a, of a toxic relationship, so that kept pulling me back in, mm -hmm. right? So. Um, I got out of the treatment facility and I just made a conscious decision, man. I'm working a program, I'm doing all that or whatever. I'm like, you know what, man? I'm gonna get high. And uh, and I chose to do fentanyl and um, it didn't agree with me, right? So uh, I uh, I ended up in OSU um, on life support for just over four days with no brain activity and um, uh, you know, this is where um, I really started believing God, you know, because um, it was like at that day, um, I was either going to come come to life or they was going to pull the plug. Like, I mean, it's, you know, so that really, really catapulted me into, you know what, man, I got to take this stuff serious. You know, so. uh, what kind of supports helped you in your early recovery? I managed to put together almost a year of just white knuckled I'm working a program but it's just I'm only surrendering what I want to surrender and stuff so but yeah um, so what does your recovery look like today oh it's beautiful man um, so uh, I'm so blessed I'm so blessed with uh, all the opportunities that are set before me um, I have 26 months or whatever I don't actually have a day you know I just uh, uh, I don't know man what God's doing in my life um, I get to work directly with people every day in recovery um, I'm a peer supporter uh, it's my 9 to 5 um, I go out to our local jail and um, uh, teach a Christ centered recovery class on Wednesdays um, I'm very active in the community um, in recovery, I'm uh, active in in church with uh, doing a recovery ministry there, and uh, it's just it's amazing, man. I get to just go out and just you know share hope with people, whatever that looks like, meeting people right where they are, like how people met me. Can you share any stigmas that you may have faced in while recovering? So that could have been from family, friends, community, employment, or healthcare. You know, I guess. Uh, in early recovery, I struggled with really wanting to admit it, you know, um, because of stigmas or labels or whatever. Like, um, uh, spirituality is my number one, right? Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, my higher power is God and Jesus Christ is my Savior. And um, my background doesn't always, um, uh, it's not real popular in some arenas, you know, church arenas and stuff like that, you know what I mean? So, um, I've faced a lot of judgment there or whatever. Um, uh, I've been to prison four times and, and I, uh, embraced every aspect of that. I'm covered with tattoos head to toe and, you know, so, um, people look at the cover of the book and they don't, you know, some people do and, you know, and so, um, that's, um, that was something that I dealt with early on. Um, and today it's just another you know, uh, page of my story, you know, and when I actually get to sit down and talk with people, you know, like, um, these scars is what get me where I am today, you know, that's what, you know, that'll, you know, um, my prison number, my, my history opens the door at the jail. How has recovery helped you to heal the relationships damaged in your active addiction? So, man, like, this is the best question right here, bro, and, um, 
So three weeks ago, um, uh, my daughter reached out to me. I have three daughters. Uh, my daughter reached out to me, and I wasn't a dad, man. I was beyond absent. You know, if I wasn't in jail, I was jailed in my addiction, right? So three weeks ago, my daughter reached out, um, and uh, we have been in constant contact every day since then. Um, uh, doing stuff, you know, uh, uh, and I know that the Lord is, is bringing the other two in and stuff, but it's like, uh, it's bridged gaps, you know, with, um, you know, my parents, my, my brothers, um, just, uh, even not so, um, close family or whatever, but, uh, man, it's, uh, you know, uh, my dad will leave me in his house alone if necessary. I can drive his car, you know, um, if, if I need it, you know. Um, uh, I can be a dad today, man. Um, on Father's Day, it's the first Father's Day that I had in a long time. And my daughter's with me and, um, you know, I'm, I'm going to, uh, uh, I have a friend slash guy that I'm helping um, in recovery and it just so happened he was doing a remedial driving course and it was in Marion so I was going to pick him up my daughter's with me I get a call from a guy um, that's in a treatment center that um, that I helped in recovery and he calls me and he said um, and I'm driving I got the phone on speaker I don't know what it's going to be right and the guy said Dougie I just want to tell you um, how much I appreciate um you helping me in recovery and leading me to Jesus, man, because, um, you know, I know that I'm in God's will today with what I'm doing, and, you know, um, I just want to just thank you so much. And, um, you know, we have a couple minute conversation. My daughter's hearing all this, and I hung the phone up, and she's like, she's like, Dad, you, you truly are a different person, and, you know, none of that was orchestrated, you know, it's just, it's what I, I'm going to do what I do regardless who's around me, you know, and, yeah, it's just, you know, such a, a great feeling, so fulfilling, you know, so. Did your daughters ever get any additional help, so like Alateen or anything like that, something for support for them, therapy or anything? They didn't, um, you know, uh, that I'm aware of, you know. Um, uh, they're tough, man. They're tough. They, they did it. Um, you know, I have... Um, uh, two of them have the same mom. My youngest has a different mom. Um, that's, um, uh, that's a different relationship there that, um, you know, I've been very estranged in that, with that relationship. But my oldest two daughters, um, uh, all three of them had, have a great mom and they definitely picked up the slack where, where I was. So I want to say that first and foremost. Um, but, um, the oldest two, they're very independent, um, and uh, uh, my 18-year-old, she's the one that I have the contact with now, um, she's reached out because um, she's been going through some things on her own, and, you know, uh, I'm going to give God the glory and just orchestrate that to uh, bring us together in that, and, and I'm able to help her today, and, 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 uh, for me, I'm able to be her dad and and guide her in areas that will be uh, beneficial for her. What what I think, you know what I mean. So um, I'm going to be dad, but I know that you know my pastor will pastor you. I know that this person can help you. I know that this person will do this right. So um, I can do that today. So. Okay, so I want you to look at this camera. I want you to share some inspiration and hope for those who are still struggling with addiction. Okay, so. Um, if I can share anything, it's, it would be, uh, you can do it. You can do it through surrender, um, just hard work, um, and it's just getting there. It's pulling the trigger on it, you know, just making that decision and following through with it. And if you fall down, get back up. And if you fall down, get back up. And if you fall down, get back up. You know, there is hope. Whatever it looks like for you, whether it be... Um, a 12-step program, whether it be a church, with whatever your relationship is with whatever higher power that you have, just continue to pursue that. Um, I know that what works for me 
and I know that um, there is hope available for any and all of us. Is there anything that we missed that you would like to share with the world? Recovery is possible. You know it. You know it. You're living it yourself, man. Um, uh, I really admire what you guys are, are doing, and it's yeah, just get it out there. Get it. People can change. People do change, you know. And as long as uh, we continue doing what we're doing, you know, uh, there's hope. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to come out and talk with On the Road to Recovery today to share some inspiration and hope for those who still need to hear it. Your story will help spread awareness, humanize addiction, end stigma, and inspire hope one story at a time.